Hi, everybody. I'm Jesse Colin Jackson, Executive Director of UCI's Beale Center for Art and Technology. I'm going to look at the correct camera now. There's a camera there. Hi, everyone joining us on Zoom. I'd like to welcome you to the second of three events in our speaker and symposium series this year, focused on difference machines, technology, and identity in contemporary art. Difference Machines is an urgent show created in response to ongoing conversations about systemic inequities wrought by technologies. The diverse group of 17 artists in the show have creatively, and collectives, have creatively reimagined the digital tools that shape our lives. The exhibition includes projects that span at least three decades, the last three decades, ranging from software-based art and internet art to animated videos, bioart experiments, digital games, and 3D printed sculptures. If you haven't been to the show, I urge you to go right away. Um, it's traveled to us from the Buffalo AKG Art Museum as the first stop on a national tour. We're so pleased to be able to host the exhibition and especially pleased to have the curators of the show with us today, who I'll introduce in a moment. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge our audience, both in person and online. So last year, like many institutions, we hosted these events entirely on Zoom. This year we have a hybrid, we're doing it all. We're a hybrid format. Um, we're targeting maximum impact. We're almost 500 people right now. 400 of them are in my class. We're in my classroom audience online. You can't see that, although you will in a moment. Um, and the students in my class have all been to the show at least once and have been preparing questions for the curators. I'd also like to acknowledge that the University of California, Irvine, is located on the ancestral and unceded shared territory of the Hashiman and Tongva peoples, which extends from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. We are grateful to these original stewards of the land where we live, work, study, and who, despite the history of violence and racism, forced displacement, land theft, and colonialism, still hold strong cultural, spiritual, and physical ties to this region. I'd also, also like to acknowledge the enduring support of the Claire Trevor School of the Arts and the Beale Family Foundation in bringing you this show and all of our shows since the year 2000. We have some tremendously exciting exhibitions coming up. This fall, we're hosting the Leonardo Cryptech Incubator Exhibition focused on disabled artists remaking creative technology through the lens of accessibility, Next spring, we have a solo show by Catherine Behar, who just this month won a Creative Capital, last month, sorry, Creative Capital Wild Futures Award. Next fall, we have Future Tense, Art, Complexity, and Predictability, which thanks to the generosity of the Getty Foundation, will be our most ambitious project ever, expanding to two partner venues. We'll be hosting a symposium about this project this spring, to which you're all invited, and that will be our final event in the year series. Most of these activities are thanks to David Familian, our Beale Center Artistic Director, who's with us here today on Zoom. You'll see him in a moment. Over the past 15 years, David has established the Beale Center for Art and Technology as one of the most vital new media venues in Los Angeles. Well, I'm going to say the most vital new media venue in Los Angeles and among the best in the United States. Uh, none of these activities would get off the ground without the tireless efforts of our Associate Director, Fatima Manalili, who's here in person. Um, thank you, David and Fatima, for all that you do for us. Further thanks to UCI Media, also here today in person, for making all this complexity possible, to my teaching assistants, and to UCI Illuminations for supporting this event. To those of you on Zoom, um, we do want this to be interactive, so please type in any questions you have. Those of you here in person, you'll be invited to come speak to a microphone, or we'll, we have a, a microphone we can hand out. Um, okay, and lastly, because I have the site open, I want to talk about one final, so we're at this event, the exhibition is here, of course. We have. Another event, uh, Tina is joining us in person next uh, in a couple of weeks for a curator's tour of the show on March 16th at 6 p.m. So please join us for that if you can. Onwards with introductions, and then I'll step off the stage here. The exhibition is co-curated by University of Buffalo Professor Paul Venus and Buffalo AKG Art Museum curator Tina Rivers Ryan who bring, us, bring to the project over 30 years of experience working with media art, as well as their own personal experience of how technology can both help and harm marginalized communities. Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan is an anteater. Um, she graduated, she, well, she, she came here for some time, graduated with one of her many degrees. She's also been a curator with the AKG since 2017. Pr prior to that, she was a curatorial research assistant in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Met. Um, she's a recognized expert in the field of media art, including video, digital, and internet art. She holds five degrees in art history, including a BA from Harvard, a PhD from Columbia, and a master's degree from UCI, and has received the prestigious Art Writers Grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation for her current project on the Web 3.0. Her next major exhibition, Electric Op, will open at the AKG in the fall of 2024. 
Paul Venus is a professor of art and founding director of the Coalesce Center for Biological Art at the University at Buffalo. Since the 1990s, his projects have foregrounded the social consequences of new technologies. His most recent works, and works include genetic experiments that examine his own Jamaican-American parentage to undermine scientific constructions of race. Paul's honors for his media art include a 2006 Creative Capital Grant and the 2019 Golden Nika at Pre Ars Electronica. Paul had a solo show with us years, a few years ago, about 10 years ago now, focused on the creative applications of DNA, and so we're so pleased to welcome him back. Tina and Paul are true luminaries in our corner of the world, and we're so honored to have them and their work before us today. Together, they received a 2022 Award for Excellence from the Association of Art Museum Curators for this very exhibition. Please welcome Tina and Paul, who will tell you a little bit about Difference Machines. Okay. Um, so Tina and Paul, why don't you jo join us, turn your videos on, if, and David as well for a moment. And we'll, everyone can say hello. Uh, I have to stop sharing my screen. That's my problem. There we go. You were doing that already. Thank you. Um, so everyone, this is who we were just talking about. And David, why don't, why don't we both step away so Tina and Paul can have the floor for a little presentation. Um, and first of all, okay, here we go. So now I have the ability to share screen. Is it also okay if we record? I guess as long as Paul's okay with it, we're, we're okay with it. And we're also recording at our end and we'll have a kind of finished product. So if you don't want to, we'll make one. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so tell you what, if you're recording, then great. So go ahead and, um, and record because uh, Paul and I are working on an article about the Difference Machines exhibitions. And it occurred to me that um, it would be really helpful to have, um, have a record of what we're saying here. Okay, so let me go ahead and share screen. Um, so Paul and I have a, a bit of an outline of how we want to proceed over the next 30 minutes or so, but we really do want to have a conversation with you guys as much as we can. Um, uh, and hopefully many of you have had a chance to see the exhibition. Uh, we heard that you were drafting questions and posting your photos, so we're really excited to get into it with you. Um, we're going to begin uh, by introducing ourselves and how the project began. So I will just say you already heard. My name is Tina Ryan. I am curator at the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. And for those of you who haven't been to Western New York, uh, we were formerly known as the Albright Knox Art Gallery. So founded in 1862, one of the oldest museums in America, actually, um, dedicated to contemporary art since the 1860s. So um, uh, as an institutional curator there, I um, was sort of responsible, uh, along with Paul, for curating this exhibition, which uh, was shown at uh, in Buffalo at our temporary offsite uh, exhibition space uh, in 2021, while the main campus of the museum was closed for construction. So the installation photo that you're looking at here, um, this is not normally what our museum looks like, but we had this fantastic opportunity to curate an exhibition. Um, in this space uh, on the east side of Buffalo. Um, so I don't think I want to say any more about myself. I just wanted to sort of situate myself within the institution and explain the Buffalo AKG's role in all of this. Of course, we're very delighted now that the exhibition has traveled over to the Beale Center, which is, um, you know, an institution that I've looked up to for a really, really long time and that Paul, in fact, has worked with. So Paul, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Tina. Um, I, I should say, now that you're looking at this picture, everybody, look how different the show is um, in Buffalo. So uh, it was great, you know, uh, working with David and Fatima and Jesse uh, at, at, at the Beale and really reconstruct, like, basically, knowing that we weren't going to drop a single work, but we were going to make sure we figured out how to fit things in a completely different kind of space that I think afforded like a lot of other really interesting uh, things to happen. So um, it's really nice to be able to do a show twice and have it look so absolutely different. And, you know, you approach different pieces when you come in and different pieces kind of interact with each other in different ways really nicely too. Uh, I'll say just quickly be because of Jesse's introduction, um, he went over some of the things I've done. I've done. Um, as an artist, basically what I've been interested in since the 90s is this idea of uh, emerging media forms. And the idea of emerging media is the idea that uh, like working as an artist, not necessarily with pre-existing uh, official media, but sort of taking very techn technological media and basically forcing them to communicate in ways sometimes even seemingly against that technology's will. And so that's where my interest in this has come from. And I began in the in the 90s working with 
uh, interactive technologies primarily and, and uh, computer programming and things like AI. And I gravitated sort of slowly from the late 90s into the biotechnological arena. So that's me. I'm going to let Tina go for me go with the uh, background. <laughs> Sure. So, um, so Paul and I started organizing this ex exhibition in 2020, and um, I'm pulling up another page on the museum's website um, called Beyond the Exhibition that includes a lot of resources that we have for people to learn more about the um, basically the theme of the show. So, uh, before we get too far into it, I just want to explain that this exhibition emerged um, in this very particular historical moment, which is America in 2020, um, when there was uh, a conversation happening in a national scale about systemic inequality, um, and particularly systemic forms of racism. And um, in the wake of the George Floyd protests um, and sort of like increasing awareness about um, uh, sort of police brutality, but also discrimination against African Americans, uh, people started having a conversation, uh, I think on a national level, really for the first time about not just individual racism, which is the conversation we were having when I was in college, right? More about sort of, you know, individual prejudice, but about systemic prejudice and systemic inequality. In other words, understanding how bias against marginalized communities was actually baked into the infrastructures of our society, was baked into our legal system, for example. Um, and so we, um, you know, are, we're very much informed by a lot of recent scholarship that has happened about um, uh, the fact that uh, technology is also another form of infrastructure that is baking in forms of um, bias, discrimination, prejudice into American society. And of course, you know, really it's a global phenomenon, right? But we were really, you know, um, responding to some research that's been done about what's going on here. So um, some of the books and, and sort of articles and things that have come out in the past five to 10 years, um, we link to them here if people want to learn more. Um, some of these are even older. Some of these are like 20 years old. Um, I will say probably the, the one that really um, uh, a lot of people know about and, and have been reading is this book, Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Moja Noble, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. And if you look at the cover of this book, you see that um, you know it, it, it's looking like somebody has entered in a search query in Google saying, why are Black women so? And then if you've ever used Google search, you know that Google immediately will try to auto-populate um, uh, you know, what your search terms are based on uh, sort of algorithmically what other people have searched for. And so if you look at, you know, on the cover of this book, those terms that come up, right, angry, loud, mean, attractive, lazy, annoying, confident, sassy, insecure. This uh, cover image, I think, is a really great way to get into the theme of the show, right, which is thinking about how our digital tools, by which we mean databases, algorithms, um, uh, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, all of this, how are these, um, when I say baking in, how are they propagating, um, how are they disseminating forms of, of bias on a systemic level, right? Um, so uh, if anybody is curious, again, there are many, 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 many books that approach this topic from different angles. Some of these specifically deal with um, this topic from a feminist angle. Some of them deal with it from uh, the angle of race. Um, some of them deal um, with this topic from the, the perspective of indigeneity. Um, and then also queer studies has had a lot to say um, about you know, bias that's embedded in technology um, against queer people. I will also point out that some of these books are not just about bias and technology. They're also about the way that technology has allowed marginalized communities to um to to gather and to advocate for themselves and so you know from the very beginning there was a sort of double double edged nature of the exhibition right understanding that on the one hand technologies are really doing a lot of harm um as sophia noble's book sort of you know very uh, forcefully put on the table but on the other hand you know for a lot of communities um actually the internet has been a really powerful medium um, in, in terms of, you know, finding each other, um, you know, thinking about the website Grinder, for example. I mean, it may seem sort of like obvious now that something like that exists, but when I was in college, there wasn't something like that. 
um, for queer people to, to sort of find themselves like a dating app like that. So, um, so, you know, over the past 20 years, people have really been thinking about how we experience our identities, how we understand our identities, how we find community, how all of this is now being shaped by digital tools. Um, and I will hand it over to Paul to see, uh, I, I feel like I might've stolen some of your thunder there, but, um, hopefully, I, you know, there's more for you to say. Less work for me. <laughs> Anyways, the, uh, the, the theme of the show is, you know, difference machines. Um, we, we took really seriously, I guess, why I think it made, it, it was sort of our unifying thing that, uh, allowed us to sort of think about hundreds of different artists work and to narrow it down to, to representing these, um, these 17. And the, and the idea of difference uh, is that difference in this context is, is actively produced, right? We wanted to look at works that took on the idea that difference isn't something essential or something internal or something, you know, sort of like, quote unquote, sort of uh, uh, pre-language, pre somehow something uh, completely objective, but rather um, difference was something produced externally. Uh, uh, and that the categories of difference are themselves also incredibly cultural, con culturally constructed. And there are a lot of artists, of course, taking these these issues on, and these are the ones we are kind of most interested. The, the show then, it's not a sort of, you know, celebration of, you know, a celebration of our differences um, in, in that sense. It's a, it's really a group investigation into the, into the construction of identity, you know, identities that um, in some cases artists are, um, embracing uh maybe exaggerating maybe you know strategically taking advantage of uh and in others complicating um and in others um you know hacking and evading uh uh undermining uh charting you know sort of showing where the where, where the constructions are coming from um the title of the exhibition also, diff, you know, Difference Machines, it's also riffing on uh, Charles Babbage. Uh, Charles Babbage was an English inventor who in the 1830s approximately invents a series of uh, things he calls the difference engine. Sometimes this one might even be the analytical engine, but let's let's call it the difference engine. Um, and um, uh, and that's and. We're riffing off that in a sense for, for multiple reasons. For one, it's often one that um, historians of technology like to kind of favor as one of the one of the first uh, uh, computers. Um, and this show is about technology. Uh, but on the other hand, we wanted to show that, um, uh, as Tina was saying, that, that that this kind of construction that we're talking about these systemic operations uh, are like cultural machinations or cultural machines. So there's also a way of kind of thinking, you know, this sort of a cultural machine as being a broadening of the idea of, of sort of just sort of a show about difference in technology. In this sense, it's about technology also as these systemic things. I, I think it's also looking at this image. I also think, you know, it is one of these kind of quintessentially kind of enlightenment machines. Uh, I mean, the Enlightenment was a time really where the notion, I think the very word differentiation is invented. Um, it starts first appearing in the Enlightenment. And it's a time in which the idea of differentiating becomes really like an epistemic virtue. It becomes something that to differentiate is just good in and of itself, whereas to fail to differentiate is a failure or somehow a lack of intelligence. So that's why this 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 machine and this uh, this reference to me seem to be key in in putting together the show. Uh, so as the institutional curator here, I, I you know have to say that there were really fun conversations that we had to have about how do we take these concepts and translate them into a general audience, uh, you know, or translate them for a general audience. And I think one of the concerns was that you know, the title of the show is really, um, it's a kind of pun for those who know the history of computation, <laughs> that, you know, th this concept of the, you know, difference machines is like, we're invoking the concept of the difference engine um, and making that sort of historical reference point. And the, and the question was, would the title work even if you weren't one of like the five people in Buffalo who know the history of computation and know what a difference engine is. Um, two of those five being like me and Paul. <laughs> so we, um, we, we, as Paul said, we were sort of hoping that this idea 
even if you don't know the history of the difference engine, the idea of the difference machine really unlocks something central to the show, which as Paul said, is this idea that difference must be produced, right? Difference um, has to be machined, right? And we want to think about what are the technologies that today are producing difference, right? For better and for worse. Um, so uh, that was sort of our abstract uh, introduction to some of the, the sort of theoretical and historical thinking behind the show. Um, I now have the distinct pleasure of walking you guys through some of the artworks. Um, and I will say just as, um, you know, by way of introduction, this show was conceived as a kind of, you know, a survey show as well as a thematic one. So um, uh, the show begins in the early 1990s and continues up until the very present. Um, it includes 17 artists, 19 works by 17 artists. So it's sort of a large group show. Um, and it was very important to us that we really um, stress a few things uh, throughout the exhibition. One is uh, to really show the f that um, artists have been contributing to this dialogue uh, for you know over a generation now. So you know I cited those books and I talked about how this exhibition emerged from this particular you know historical moment, America in 2020, and a sort of a couple of years of people you know writing articles and books highlighting you know technology's relationship to inequality. Um, but in fact, artists have been having this conversation, you know, since the 90s. Uh, artists have been at the forefront of this. And so something that I think is very important um, for myself as a curator of contemporary art and for Paul as an artist is um, to highlight the role of artists in um, sort of encouraging us as a society to have conversations, including sometimes difficult conversations, to reflect in this particular instance on the digital tools that we're using every day in our lives, right, which have become naturalized, by which I mean, we think of them now as almost like forces of nature, as things that you don't need a reason to exist or a purpose, but just sort of are, and also cannot be resisted or denied, right? And so we wanted to historicize technology and show that, in fact, technology is not something that is simply an element of nature. It is a man-made product, and it changes. And we really wanted to emphasize that. I mean, Paul put it um, into words, I think, so clearly something that we were both thinking. We were having these you know, conversations, basically talking almost every day, planning this exhibition for like a year and a half. And, you know, he said something like, it's really important that we show that technology has changed because it means technology can change. Right. That that, you know, technology has not always looked or functioned the way that it does now, which is something really important to remember. It seems like a very obvious point. Right. But we do, you know, especially if you think about, um, you know, the the tech industry, there is a there is this kind of narrative of perpetual progress that technology is always improving, but it almost seems like it's on its own trajectory and it's just sort of developing, almost like evolving as if it is subject only to its own internal logic. Um, so we call this technological determinism. And we really wanted to emphasize that, in fact, you know, technology is something that we make and that we can control. Um, whether it's by, for example, you know, advocating for stricter oversight um, by the government over the tech industry, or um, if you're an artist, taking technology into your own hands and making your own technology, um, which is something that obviously, you know, the coders among us can do as well. Um, so, uh, so we wanted to really show um, works made with digital tools going back to the 90s to emphasize how technologies, these technologies have been evolving over the past, you know, 30 years. Um, we also wanted to emphasize, and this is sort of maybe a secondary point, but as people who are very invested in the history of digital art um, and also in the, the aesthetic potential of digital art, we really wanted to emphasize that um, digital art can, can look like a lot of things. Um, there is an idea in, in the mainstream contemporary art world, or not an idea, but there is a kind of bias, if you will, um, where a lot of times when digital art is exhibited at galleries, um, you know, in places like Los Angeles and New York City, it really is just a kind of a digital video that's shown on a flat screen that's hung on a wall. Or maybe it's a digital photo that's printed out and hung on the wall. And we wanted to show that, you know, digital art, it can it can be that, but it also can take a lot of other forms. And that one of the things that made so many people, including us, so excited about digital art was the fact, for example, that digital art 
is, you know, or can be interactive. It allows for somebody to not just be a, a sort of passive spectator of an artwork, however mentally and emotionally engaged you might be, but to really like almost collaborate with the artist in, in making the artwork, um, you know, uh, exist or be meaningful or even change. Um, so uh, we wanted to show a, a wide variety of formats. So even in this installation photo, you can see there um, on the far wall, there are two computer two computer screens um, on tables. And that's actually an interactive game that you can play by AM Dark. That's part of this larger installation that includes digital images that were printed out on canvas and framed on the wall. Um, they're also in the middle here with the blue wall is work by Sandra Perry that, yes, it includes a video that's playing on a flat screen, but it also right in front of that wall has these two sculptural stands that have flat screen monitors embedded in them. So these are video sculptures um, that occupy the space of the room, just like a sculpture would on a pedestal where you can walk around it in 360 degrees. Um, the, the show also includes um, sculptures. So if you look past those video stands, you see the purple wall off in the distance. In front of that um, are two black pedestals that have 3D printed sculptures in them. So um, in some versions of the exhibition, we have these 3D printed sculptures. Um, there are, you know, printed photographs, uh, you know, just to really show the, the, the sort of variety of formats that digital art can take um, and the variety of aesthetic experiences. So, um, one other thing I'll mention before I get into some more specific examples is also we wanted the works to really emphasize um, the diversity of people making digital art. Um, it's been very frustrating in a way that to the extent that there has been a market for digital art within the larger market of contemporary art, many of the artists who have become most famous, um, who have had you know, the most opportunities to exhibit their work, or who have um, you know, had the most opportunities to have their work collected by private collectors and major institutions are almost exclusively white, straight, North American and European men. Um, when in fact, if you look at the history of digital art, it has always been a really diverse community of practitioners. Um, and this has historically been true for um, video art as well um, since the 1960s that these new media technologies, be it digital, networked, software, art, et cetera, um, have always been, um, you know, for various reasons, uh, really attractive to people um, who come from backgrounds that are marginalized by mainstream society. Um, and, you know, uh, that includes, for example, uh, members of the African diaspora, members of the queer community, uh, members of the in indigenous communities and also the disabled. So um, we really wanted to create space for these artists um, to reflect upon the relationship between technology and identity from their own subject positions, right? Their own very embodied subject positions. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to let Paul now take it away. So Paul, um, if you want to um, begin with the Keith Piper work still, I'll go ahead and pull that up. And I will just say, as I'm scrolling through the website, um, I again, we, we understand that many of you have seen the exhibition, but um, for those of you who haven't, or for those of you who want a reminder, I will just say that the Buffalo AKG Art Museum um, did something very unusual for us. And you know, hopefully this will set a precedent for the future. Insofar as we actually put a ton of documentation of this exhibition on the internet, so every artist has their own page on our website and you can scroll through. And um, when you click, for example, on Keith Piper, you can see um, a photo of Keith Piper, a biography, a link to his website, watch a short interview with Keith Piper that we produced um, where he reflects about his relationship to technology um, and then installation photos of Keith's work. Um, the wall label in which we offer our own curatorial perspective on this particular work by Keith, and then links to other resources. So a place where you can go on the internet to watch this, you know, a clip of this project, or a place where you can go on the internet and read um, an article about this work, um, et cetera. And it just keeps going. So we definitely, um, here's an interview with Keith. It's a fantastic online resource. So Every single one of the artworks in the show has all of this material. So I will go ahead and pull up for Paul um, our installation photos. Great, thanks. I mean, what's what's funny, I realize in in 
you know, saying, uh, you know, oh, our show has 30 years of um, artwork, which would be uh, probably uh, not seen as very exceptional um, if with most artistic forms to be looking back, we'd say, well, those are all contempt. That's all the contemporary era. Um, but of course, with um, a, a technology based show, um, it's it's kind of um, it's quite hard to do. And it's also unusual. I mean, not only is there kind of an expectation that when you show technology based work, oh, it's about having a certain kind of bleeding edge of experimentation that the artists are that the, the whole point of working with these is necessarily just to sort of experiment with technology so that then uh, businesses can find useful new applications for that technology or something, right? So a lot of times we're, we're so used to seeing shows of technology. If you if you go to these shows that are all sort of works from the last five years. Well, in this case, um, again, it just seemed really important to validate people who I think were making work when it was um, when, when when the least of it was around. When when as Tina was saying, when the the field felt um, it felt like there was a kind of um, I guess sort of a uh, there were certain themes which which people were working with and all the exhibitions seemed to want, which is particularly themes like, you know, what's the relationship of technology to the body? And whenever they did shows like that, it always tended to be the body in general, never sort of the body of the other, but it tended to be the sort of almost like you almost had to think of like the Leonardo da Vinci, um, you know, uh, the Leonardo da Vinci body, the sort of default. Um, hold on a second. Oh, sorry. Uh, oops. All right. Sorry about that. The default, as I was saying, the default was sort of white male body. Well, one of the first um, artists in this, the, the oldest piece in this exhibition uh, is by an artist named Keith Piper. Uh, and this piece is, is called Tagging the Other. Uh, it was created in 1992, um, so uh, just over 30 years ago. Um, uh, Keith is, is, is a fascinating artist. He was a member of the uh, Black Arts Movement in Britain um, in the 80s and 90s, which was this, you know, again, kind of an incredibly important movement. He was one of the first people I knew of to also be working with kind of as many different uh, technologies as he was, and always with the idea of always, you know, having to kind of hack into these forms to be able to produce things that he was interested in. Um, this is a piece that formerly, uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, I mean, it was fascinating when, when you first saw this piece, it was completely fascinating. What he did, it was in the early days of projection based, uh, you know, computerized images. And when he decided it was rather than sort of making a kind of a singular projection, uh, and to kind of having us fetishize that there's a projection, which is, which overlays four video monitors. And the projection then is this kind of, um, it can be seen almost as a kind of a surveillant web or a kind of network uh, that kind of spans the globe. Uh, and it's got this expansive feeling and it kind of is, is it's sort of describing itself, describing itself in terms of the kind of the area it covers and its operations. And then meanwhile, in these monitors, there, there are sort of four distinct ways in which the other can be kind of digitally tagged and labeled and and made sense of and if you if you spend some time with those monitors um with, with those pieces in the show you'll see that um uh the language that he's using was really coming out of um some of the really fascinating sort of post-colonial writing that was done um at the university of Bir birmingham for instance at the time uh it's all you know thinking thinking in the in a postmodern sense about the way that it's sort of a regime of signs are building a top the face, right? This is this. If you think about Deleuze, uh, the face in this images is subject to a regime of faciality, right? It's it's a it's a it's a it's a screen upon which a bunch of cultural signifiers about the meaning of that body can be placed. So, so I guess I I love this work because it's so incredibly kind of conceptually heady, um, and then of course it's also completely prescient. Like this work is done before the age of machine vision. Um, it's anticipating that, of course, uh, you know, uh, mach machine vision will be integrated um, with global computer systems in ways that will will come to the aid of the surveillance state. Um, so that's the pieces we installed it at the Albright. Um, uh, looks a little bit different at the at the Beale.
Um, maybe well, take a yeah. time to let me just go into Scalinati. Should we do that? Can we quickly look at um, uh, Raphael? Sure, sure. I guess another piece I thought was an interesting compliment to, to Keith's work in the show, also by an artist um, uh, that's been active since since the 90s, uh, Raphael is on a hammer. I'll go kind of quickly in this one. Uh, the piece we have by 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 Raphael is a piece called um, Level of, Confi of, of um, Confidence. Um, and it's uh, it is also a work of machine vision. It's also looking at the, the 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 faces of the other, um, and in this sense, and with a kind of completely different message. Um, in this case, we we have you know the faces of disappeared in Mexico who are never found and never located, and the system basically is is actively looking at every face that comes in front of it, searching for the faces of one of those disappeared. So it's a very haunting piece. Um, I, I find one of the most poetic parts of it is that it's a it's a piece that shows a technology that of course can never work. You're never going to find these people. Certainly not by looking in the art galleries uh, at somebody coming to look at at, uh, at at works of art. Right? These people these people have disappeared, and nobody nobody was uh, ever uh, punished for it or for disappearing uh, a whole a whole school full of Mexican students. Um, so it, it, I like the piece because it's got this incredible kind of self-reflexive quality. It's a piece that the technology that seemingly works, it looks at faces and it judges the level of um, relation, the relationship of a face in front of it to the people on the screen. But of course, it can never actually succeed. It kind of is showing the idea that even when it works, it doesn't work for the people who actually need it. This is machine vision. And lastly, I'll say Rafael Zanger Hammer has a very funny thing to say about machine vision in general, right? As we see it like now in subway systems and our, our roadway systems and our schools, you know, uh, and we start to question like, do we really need all this facial recognition uh, software uh, mechanisms? Um, Rafael Zanger Hammer says, well, you know, uh, yes, it's a problem, uh, basically, um, we shouldn't have these technologies. The only people who should be able to use these technologies are artists. Yeah, he said very explicitly, he thinks facial recognition technology should be illegal, except for <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll let you, I'll let you go on with uh, Scalinati's work. I guess I also really like this, like that work because it's also, it's, it's interactive work and it's showing a kind of interactivity that is atypical and which artists were hacking into since the nineties um, and, um, and it's not sort of you know, uh, art that sort of is, is sitting still. Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, you know, this this technology, uh, this exhibition has always sort of had two poles. Um, I you said earlier, sort of double edged sword, um, you know, that on the one hand, technology is very harmful. But on the other hand, technology actually um, can be helpful. Uh, and can be, you know, create really meaningful experiences for communities that um, especially might not have had access to the means of production for mass media. Um, and so that is one reason, for example, why a lot of marginalized people have been drawn to working with video and digital tools is because their stories haven't really been told by mainstream media corporations, by the broadcast media. And so um, you know, when video came along, for example, it gave women and, you know, uh, Afro Latino people living in the Bronx and all these other communities, the chance to actually like make their own television and tell their own stories and talk about their communities. Um, when, you know, the major networks, for example, weren't coming into their communities and telling their stories. Um, and so that trajectory um, is represented in this exhibition by the work of Skawanati, who is a Mohawk artist uh, based in Montreal, um, who back in the 1990s became a real pioneer of what we call net art or internet-based art um, when she co-founded um, a, a group called Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, which um, basically is uh, a community that um, exists in places like Second Life. Um, and if you guys know Second Life, uh, they still have a ton of, you know, daily active users. I don't know if any of you are on Second Life, but it is um, an online engine, a, a metaverse, I guess now we would call it, uh, where people can create avatars and interact um, between avatars and tell their own stories. And so 
Um, you know, as is reflected in the title of Abtech, Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, Scott Wenatchee, you know, starting in, in the late 90s, saw that the internet was becoming a new kind of territory and thinking about how the territory of Indigenous North Americans had been colonized, um, wanted to imagine, well, what would happen if we as Indigenous people, you know, colonize cyberspace and create a space for us in cyberspace um, where, you know, we can uh, sort of control our narrative and also imagine us as existing in the future. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with Afrofuturism, which is a movement of the African diaspora that uses the language of science fiction in order to sort of imagine, uh, you know, uh, people of color living in uh, sort of like science fiction worlds, um, which very poetically underscores the idea that the story of people of color is not just in the past, um, it's actually the future. And it may seem sort of self-evident to say this in a sense, because um, you probably are familiar with the demographic statistics that people um, uh, interpret as suggesting the browning of America, that America demographically with every census is becoming less white and um, is becoming more a country of people of color. Um, but, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, obviously has to be sort of fought for in a sense, um, and especially for autonomy, for communities of color to have um, a control over their future. And um, especially with indigenous communities, you know, who so often when they're represented in mainstream narratives are represented as parts of the past. Like we think of indigenous communities as something that's in the history textbooks, like they were colonized and then they are no more. Um, but uh, indigenous futurism really asks us, again, using the language of science fiction, to imagine that indigenous people actually are still here today. They exist in the present and they will exist in the future, right? They are not going to be eradicated by colonizers. So um, I, what Skawanati does to make her art is she goes into Second Life and she creates avatars and she creates costumes for these avatars and then she builds environments for these avatars to inhabit and then basically um, directs movies inside of Second Life using these costumes and these and these uh, or these avatars and these sets that she's built um, and then records from inside Second Life. So this is a genre of digital art called machinima or machine made cinema. And so it's when you make movies, not by having a camera, um, you know, uh, whether it's an analog or a digital camera and recording through a camera, this is not a lens based form of filmmaking. This is creating movies inside, you know, um, game engines or virtual worlds. Right. So um, her machinima film um, in a difference machines uh, is called she falls for ages and it is a 20 minute movie that basically retells the Haudenosaunee creation story. Um, in which Sky Woman, you know, falls down to Turtle Island, and this is the, you know, the origin of the world. And so she retells this narrative. It's sort of like Star Wars, where, you know, it starts out like it was a, a story a very, very long time ago and far away, and yet it looks like it's actually set in the future. Sort of similar thing, right? She's telling this creation story that, you know, I guess in theory happened before the world was created, but looks like it was set in um, the sort of, you know, a distant future. Um, and so... Uh, you know, I think Scott Winati is a great example of somebody who is, um, you know, thinking about digital tools as a way for her particular community to tell their own stories, right? And also to create space for their communities um, to um, to powwow, right? Another organization she founded in the 90s was called Cyber Powwow. And this is basically about having indigenous powwows in cyberspace. Um, so um, that's that's something we wanted to hold space for within the exhibition, just to acknowledge that um, digital technology, you know, can also play a role in community building, in representation, and in um, and in advocacy and also healing. Um, so um, I think with that, um, I will go ahead and and Paul, do we feel good about wrapping up our presentation here? I think we sort of covered all of our major points. The, yeah. the one. Yeah, the, the one other thing I just wanted to say really quickly is that, you know, for those of you who are artists or who are curators or who might be inspired to become artists or curators, um, which would be amazing, uh, you know, I will say that, you know, curating media art is a very, very sort of 
philosophically, conceptually, materially, technologically rich practice within the field of contemporary art, um, uh, which is my euphemism for saying like, it is so hard, um, but I love it so much. It is, you know, uh, I love working with this material precisely because of the challenges that it poses. So digital artworks, uh, unless you're talking about, you know, something that is a completely static, like a 3D printed sculpture, are what is known as variable media. And what we mean by this is that every time the work is displayed, it can vary. It can be shown differently. Um, and this is usually the case because most digital art requires hardware systems like monitors, for example. And those monitors may not always be the same every time the work is shown. They can actually change. So, um, for example, I'm showing you here on the screen this work by Saya Wolfhawk. Um, which, you know, in our presentation in Buffalo that you see here had nine screens and, you know, has a certain kind of horizontality to it. But the presentation at the Beale only has eight screens and is on a wall that is more vertical and there's more of a verticality. But, you know, the eight files are identical to the eight files that, you know, of the nine that we showed in Buffalo. And yet the work feels very different in some sense. Um and so uh, I just wanted to point out that, you know, um, uh, just on a very practical level, in case you're looking at some of these photos and being like, well, that kind of looks like the work at the Beale, but it looks a little bit different. It's like, yeah, it's variable media. So, you know, you, you know, out in California, um, David and Fatima and, and, and Jesse, you know, they, they had the challenge of installing the show using, you know, their own hardware system. So, you know, a totally different set of hardware, um, not to mention all of the furniture objects like tables and chairs. Um, and so that's sort of like the fun challenge of, of installing this work is figuring out, you know, the degree of elasticity, right? The, so there's a little bit of curatorial discretion that can come into play, but it's also up to the curators and the artists to have a conversation to figure out, you know, what does this work really need? What's really important um, in order to sort of communicate the artist's vision, right? Like what's the, what's the sort of limit past which you can't really go before you're changing the work too much? Um, and so that's something we can talk about more in Q&A if anyone's interested. And, and maybe the one quick thing I'll say before Q&A is that um, as an artist, what's really amazing about working in new media is that um, nobody exactly knows which rules apply. And so if you're interested in kind of stepping into something in which the rules are sort of very much still sort of being defined or there aren't necessarily rules and you sometimes don't fit into the regular art context and sometimes you do. And, you know, you sort of can define, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of different aspects of like how a work can be shown and exist or how it gets, uh, uh, I guess, sort of how it can be redone when when technologies begin to, to fade, you know, no longer service uh, certain works. Um, it's 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 been been interesting because I'll, if if. If the art world has been around for a long time and maybe sometimes seems a little staid in like, uh, you know, in uh, when you're looking at classical uh, histories of classical art, um, I must say working in new media has felt like um, it's, it's felt kind of liberatory in the sense that we can kind of connect to whatever kind of genres and subgenres and play by different kind of rules um, when needed. So questions. <laughs> and, and so, um, Jesse, can you confirm we've got, you know, how much time for questions again now? We got we got 20 minutes. Am I on? Perfect. You yes, you're on. You're yeah, you can read. We have about 20 minutes. And but before we do that, let's have a round of applause. So if you want to unshare your screens, you know. Um and uh oh we we were trying to make that into a ceremony. Um what <laughs> no video? What did we do? Stop video. video? I remember Where's those bathrooms. No, 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 no. This is, there, there we go. go. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to do, do it one, one more time. time. Okay, three, two, one, round of applause. <laughs> there we go. We wanted to get new media on you, or old media, or some kind of media. Um, well, prior to these questions from the class, we have two microphones roving, and we have a camera that's going to point at you, so you don't even have to get up. Um, and I know you all have a question, and I actually just wanted to, one of the reasons I wanted to pan across you was, Look, some days I incentivize attendance by giving you a bonus mark. I didn't do that today. You all came because you were interested. You all came because you went to the show and you wanted to know more. So um, we, we, now what, what's, uh, let's, have a, let's have a competition over who asked the question. got people waving their hands to ask questions. Okay. Um, I'll, Steven, you go first. Go ahead. Um, 
Okay, I got a question about like the AM dark, yay or nay. Okay, so um, how does like AM dark, AM dark, like decide to choose what figures to include along with the various stages of Kanye West's um, careers? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I was leaving my screen share just in case people need a reminder about what works we're talking about. Let me, mm -hmm. let me do that again. Let me do that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's put that back up. Um, so AM Dark, um, so thanks Stephen for your question. So AM Dark, maybe Paul, I can tackle this to start with and you can jump in if there's um, anything you want to add. Yeah, sure. Um, so AM Dark, this is AM Dark here. Um, so their work, Yay or Nay, um, is about Yay, formerly known as Kanye West. Um, and uh, it's a very complicated work a conceptual work like many of the works in the show that starts out at first glance as something that seems maybe you know really accessible um and sort of self-evident so it operates on two levels simultaneously right so the first level is it is a game that you can play that is modeled after the game guess who which is a sort of used to be a really popular board game where you know each person draws one character from a deck of characters and then their opponent gets to ask questions in order to try to guess who their character is, right? Um, and so all of the characters, like one of the things that makes this different from traditional guess who, if you've ever played traditional guess who, it's like there might be like an old white lady who looks like a grandma with gray hair. There might be like a young little boy, you know, like there's lots of different kinds of people. Um, but in AM Dark's game, all of the people are black men. Um, Many of them are Kanye or Ye at different points in Ye's career where he had different hairstyles, um, you know, different clothing styles. Um, and then the others who are not Ye at different points in Ye's career are other black male celebrities. Um, and so you can watch the video with AM where AM talks about this work. Um, but essentially to sort of paraphrase what they said, um, they really wanted to make a work that was in part a meditation on black male celebrity in the United States. Um, and that sort of encouraged us to think about um, the kinds of opportunities that are given to black men in the United States, um, the way that success is defined for black men, um, and thinking about Ye in particular as somebody who um in am's perspective really wanted to achieve the kind of power of a white man um to be rich to be famous um to be able to do whatever he wanted right um and uh to then sort of think about the limits on that um that what it means for black male celebrities despite being men and despite being rich and famous um coming up against a kind of ceiling of their blackness um and the fact that in america um race is such a determining factor and you know thinking about the intersection of race and class um and thinking about also you know how gender plays into this she you know wants you to think about the kinds of opportunities that black men may or may not have but then also through their absence to think about black women as well that as few opportunities as black men may have, black women may have even fewer um, or, you know, their opportunities for success might be even more constrained. Um, and so um, in a general sense, I think that is how I would answer who gets like, that's why there's no white people in this game. That's why there's no black women in this game. It is really about understanding masculinity and its intersection with race um, and, and power in the United States. Um, and then, you know, not to answer your question, but just to sort of bring it back to the theme of the show, you know, we were interested in this work as being part of this exhibition because it's not just a physical board game. AM Dark decided to make this an online game, which immediately brings it into the world of online gaming and encourages us maybe to think about, you know, how games themselves deal with race, for example. Um, so you guys, you know, might have, uh, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of gamers in the room. You, you might know if you read any of the like reviews of games or some of what's like going on, um, you might know about like Gamergate, 
um, and the whole sort of controversy over gender in online games. Um, you might know that there are, you know, historically there's been very poor representation of marginalized communities in online games, that when marginalized communities are represented, they tend to be heavily exoticized. Um, and there's obviously the, the problem of identity tourism. I just saw another scandal where like more gamers were sort of exposed for like cosplaying as being East Asian when they're actually white. Um, so, you know, a cosplaying is not the right word, but, um, sorry, I just blanked out on what the right word would be, but yeah, um, gaming is if you were East Asian. So, um, so yeah, so it, it brings up these interesting questions about identity on the internet and even more sort of philosophically, this question of how all of our identities in a sense are captured by digital systems because they can be named and they can be counted. So when you play this game, it puts you in the position of saying, you know, oh, well, let me try to guess your character. Let's see, uh, do they have a fade or do they have an Afro or, you know, um, are they bald? And so, for example, you know, these are all ways that we use language to try to capture someone's uh, physical characteristics, right? And this is basically how big data works when it comes to demographics, right? It's capturing, like right now, Facebook knows that I am you know, almost 40 year old, white woman with a college degree who lives in the suburbs and has a kid, right? They know that about me. That exists in a database, right? Um, and I know that they know that about me because I get ads for Botox and for freezing my eggs, right? And I'm sure that Paul does not get ads for Botox or freezing his eggs. <laughs> so, um, so this work is very much about that. So Paul, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, well, I was also going to say, you know, with, 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 Kanye having crossed a, a line, uh, you know, there's also this 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 thing, yay or nay. I mean, this piece was made a, a couple of years ago, uh, really just before our show at, at Northland. And even then, you know, right, there was this notion of right there. Here's this guy who's aligning himself with all the, you know, sort of like, um, you know, racist white nationalists. And now he's, you know, um, aligning himself with with Nazism and and things. So even then, so th there's this kind of not the, the yay or nay, I think, here is also important because this is not it's, it's not um, as you will say, it's not it's not a sort of just big and big Kanye endorsement. It's it's kind of looking at him as symptomatic of um a certain kind of also a certain kind of failing um but anyways we should go on to other pieces um obi why don't you why don't you pick someone from your side of the room or if <laughs> surely there are other questions is it another question i saw there was people with hands up before there was all these hands Maybe everyone just wanted to ask about yay. <laughs> that was that was our only question. Yeah, we need a we need a question. Do we need a question sent? Do you get your you get your you get your plus one here for your question assignment straight away? There we go. There we go. Didn't have to incentive incentivize attendance, but speaking in class is a whole other <laughs> whole other problem. So we basically they have to ask a question just uh, for the audience who's not in our class. Every student actually has to ask the curators a question. The curators don't answer all 400 questions, but they're all kind of preparing test questions here. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, Raphael Hemmer described his work as not so much an artwork as it is a campaign. So can something still be considered art even if the author didn't necessarily intend it to be so? Yeah, no, that's a, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think this is, I think, I guess also what I was trying to get at with sort of the way in which, um, in which I guess, I mean, all artists, we can sort of set our own rules or we can kind of define our, our, our ways of engagement. I mean, with this piece, it's great because, you know, he basically also sets up, you know, the very rules around how it can be distributed and makes it a kind of, makes it something that can be distributed uh, in, intentionally easily so that, because it, in, in fact this is a this is a campaign that he's trying to um promote so he's he's you know again in this case he he's he's proclaiming it an, an activist uh gesture rather than necessarily a work of art but i mean i think you have to read it different ways i mean um 
this is somebody who's been um, working within the media art world since the 90s, but all but always working in kind of the, the more interesting questions like working with, you know, virtual systems and, you know, what it means to have pieces that are uh, running in one place and being seen in another. I mean, these are really important questions, you know, in, in the 90s, you know, what it meant to kind of have a, a work of art that didn't actually exist in the place it was being experienced. Um, likewise, um, you know, he was, uh, you know, sort of from the beginning interested in, yeah, this, this technology of, um, of, of, uh, uh, machine vision and sort of sort of, you know, the idea of, of machines that surveil us, like a kind of interaction that takes place, but not sort of with the kind of intentionality of mouse clicks and sort of, you know, users getting what they want but in systems that very much kind of used your movement for their own sake, right? To generate, to, 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 to basically generate their own responses, right? Machine vision isn't something that, that, that a user necessarily feels empowered. They're fundamentally always being looked at and analyzed and, and um, uh, made sense of. So again, I, 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 I would, I, in this piece, he certainly is, is, is part of an activist campaign, but I think it also certainly is, is, from the beginning meant to function as, as an artwork. And I think the very irony of it always looking in art galleries for people who are missing and um, uh, and will, will not be found is kind of part of the, I think it's the part of the very dark irony of this piece. I will say that the, the, the short answer to that great question is that um, it's up to the artist. And um, I mean, which is not always true because I would actually argue that art historians, critics and curators also get a little bit of a say. But Raphael is very much alive. And um, I just asked him, I was like, wait a minute, you say this is a campaign, but like, is this also an artwork that we can show in an art exhibition? He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like he said that, but he also clearly is fine with it also being understood as an artwork. So when he says this is a campaign, what he means, and all, a lot of Raphael's work is sort of activist and bent. Um, but he does sell a lot of those projects to private collectors to hang in their living room, et cetera. So when he says this is a campaign, he's saying that in terms of the ratio of art versus like activism, that he thinks of this one as being a little higher on the ratio of activism, um, even though it is also an artwork. And so what that means in a very practical sense is, for example, um, you know, normally when a museum wants to exhibit the work of an artist, they might pay the artist a small fee, an honorarium for participating in the exhibition. So because this is a campaign, Raphael does not accept money for this artwork. So instead of paying him the honorarium, he asks that you donate that money to Amnesty International, right? Um, and this is not an artwork that he would sell to a private collector. This is an artwork that he makes freely available on the internet. And actually his great hope is that um, people can um, get the get the code from GitHub and make their own version of this for their own communities. Like he told me, he's like, I want to see a version of this artwork that's about like all of the indigenous women in Canada who've disappeared. You know, like I want to see a version of this of like, you know, trans women in LA who've been disappeared. Like, so he he really, it's a project for him that, you know, for him, it's the code and it's about using the code to draw attention. Um, but yes, it can also exist in an art gallery and simply because he said it could. And Paul and I think that this is very much in keeping with a kind of digital art practice where it's about sort of interactivity and it's super poetic, even the title level of confidence, right? It's this pun, like it's describing the probabilistic certainty of the match, like the artwork shows you a percentage that corresponds to the software's level of confidence that my face matches one of these faces. And it's always, of course, like extremely low. Um, but it's also about the level of our confidence as a society in these disciplinary technologies that are marketed as if they're going to keep us safe, right? Like, oh, we're going to have facial recognition and law enforcement will use that. We'll put one on every corner in New York City and it'll keep us safe from terrorism. It's like, well, but are we really confident that that's how it's being used? Are we really confident that it's not going to be used actually to surveil and and control the movement of marginalized communities, right? So that's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Time for another one? We have time for one more. Okay. Oh, back corner. And way up. Race with the microphones. Hi. Um, so in your presentation, um, 
You speak about how technology, like nature, changes over time. Would you clarify that point? Like to add on to that, does technology, in a way, mimic the natural world, or would you say technology is naturalized in our daily lives? You are practicing that question. That's like a re <laughs> well on its way to an essay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So let me let me back up for a second. So I said technology was not like nature. Um, and now I'm realizing I, I was being um, perhaps overly reductive and like, what do we mean when we say nature? Because of course your generation has grown up knowing that like climate change is a thing that we all talk about. So to you, nature does change. <laughs> um, but um, I think this idea of naturalization, um, you know, what this refers to is the way in which something that is man-made is talked about or promoted as if it is a force of nature that was not made by people, um, but that just sort of exists, right? Um, in the same way that like the weather exists or trees exist. And of course, it's I said I was being overly reductive because now we understand that actually the weather is also man-made, right? In the sense that it's also, you know, impacted by human decisions. And hopefully that's not controversial for me to say. Um, but I, uh, you know, I uh, technology. We, we also we also tend to think of nature as something that doesn't have a history. Not only is it not made by people, we also think of nature as something that doesn't have a history and doesn't change. That like, you know, when I look up at the night sky and see the stars in the sky, those were the same stars in the sky that like the ancient Romans were looking up at. Right. Or like when I, you know, um, you know, like I grew up in Florida. So for me, I was a hurricane. Like when I lived through a hurricane that like we could imagine like indigenous Floridians a thousand years ago living through hurricanes, right? That somehow it's, it just sort of perpetually repeats. And again, this is not how we, we understand now that actually like nature is changing and the climate is changing, but, um, so maybe that's where the confusion is coming in. But yeah, so technology, I was saying, is different from nature. It actually does have a history and it does change and it is made by people. And that that's important to understand um, that it's not something that just is like its own force that just sort of exists. It's like, I guess uh, another way of thinking about it is like, would it make sense to ask like why a hurricane tears down homes? That what like you'd be like, Tina, what do you mean? Why does a hurricane tear down? The hurricane doesn't have a motive. The hurricane's just a hurricane. A hurricane's just like hurricane gonna hurricane, right? Like hurricanes do what hurricanes do. There's no reason. And I think that uh, sometimes we tend to think about technology as like, you know, in that same way, it's like, well, database is gonna database. Like that's just how technology works, right? And and so what we want to say is no, database is not just gonna database. Like somebody made the database. And somebody made the database to do a very particular thing and they built it a very particular way. And, you know, this is something that Paul and I have talked about a lot that we're not yeah. trying to say that like every coder working at a tech company is themselves personally racist, right? Or sexist or ableist, right? It's just that the way that technologies get built, right, are usually built by people, um, at least at this point in time. Um, by major Silicon Valley companies, um, by people who occupy certain subject positions. And we know this because of, you know, you know, like one very famous example is like they've, you know, everyone built all of these um, faucets that use motion detection to turn on the water. And then they realize that like a lot of darker skinned uh, African-Americans, the faucets don't work on their hands. Right. And it's simply because the sensors weren't designed and tested for people with darker skin. Right. Um, so that kind of thing. I, I mean, I think what the and, and another sort of simple answer is, is that is that technology is not a sort of like natural sort of uh, is, is not a sort of um, a facet of, of nature. It's, it's human built. And and as such, I mean, it's it, it might not be something that that an individual necessarily directly controls, but it's certainly part of a certain certain kind of cultural machinations um, and it's built through those cultural machinations and into those kind of systems uh, in which, you know, um, uh, systems that are also sometimes sy systemically racist and systemically sexist or systemically misogynist. So it's it's a part of those of, of that 
those cultural systems. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's the same same ways we sometimes see like, well, technology just sort of needs to run its course. We we sometimes treat technology as if it's some kind of like a, a endangered wild animal that somehow needs to, that pre-existed us, that somehow needs to kind of just be allowed to kind of reach, go sort of where it naturally wants to go. And the same thing we tend to talk about with economics, right? That somehow it's like, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't tell capital where it gets to go and how it gets to be made because capital is somehow this or it's this part of nature itself it's it's you know uh so again i uh in this case um yeah technology like like capital is something that is a part of human culture that's too often naturalized on that inspiring note and inspiring question, um, we have 30 seconds left. And so I just want to thank Paul and Tina for joining us today, for our audience and for my students and their interest. Nope, oh, you got to hold. I got you for 25 more seconds. Um, and our next events will be our symposium. I hope to see you then. Thank you. One more round of applause.